Hello and welcome into Blockbench. It is a free-to-use 3D modeling software that is completely adapted into Minecraft model development. Mm -hmm. You can also do a bunch of other fun stuff, as you can probably tell by the left if you're a bit cheeky reading into some of the information. Regardless, we are going to take a very, very smooth and relaxed approach to how to look and work around the interface. Right? So let's begin with a bedrock model. And if we click on that, we'll be greeted by this interface. In the background here, you'll see what we're going to work with in a second. And if you were to click around the interface that I just did, it'll disappear. Wow. Why? That's not good, is it? Well, don't worry. We can get the window open again by going up to File here to the very left. Left click and click on Project. That'll bring up the very same window. In the, this window, we can give a name to our file. And I'm going to call this one Hello. Hello. Okay, that's going to be the one. Probably how you guess Swedes sound when they say hello, right? Hello. I'll do the same thing here. Hello. Don't worry about the other fields. You don't have to fill this in either. But you'll probably be forced to down the line if you want to save your file. Regardless, I'll confirm that and we're back into the interface again. Now, if it is so that your interface does not look like this, you don't have this big square, but instead you have this interface with a square up here. The way to get around that and to swap between these ones is by using the tab key on your keyboard. The tab key is located just below escape at the very up right, up left corner. Yeah, up left corner. And it's a button that either says tab or have two arrows pointing in opposite directions in a horizontal manner. If you click on that button, you'll get back to this view. If you click on it again, you'll get to this view. If you click on it again, you'll get back to this view. Well, if you look at the interface itself, we have a few potential shortcuts up here, right? Well, it's our menu bar. And in our menu bar, we can choose to click, for example, view. What I just told you about is the one thing that is blue marked here on the view. It's called toggle quad views. It allows us to see more viewports in our screen. A viewport is a different camera that watches a different angle on our model. That is all you need to know. I would refrain from using this interface when you're working with Blockbench for the first time and focus on using this interface. So tab your way until you have this interface in front of you. Now, if we were to go up to file here to the left, you ready? Get to file? Mm hmm. Good. Well, look into this. We have project. We can create a new project. You can look into recent projects, open a model from a folder on your computer. You can save the project, etc. All the way down to exporting a certain model. And we have settings. Are you with me this far? Let's click on settings. In settings, usually general is the one that you have open at the very beginning. But that doesn't matter. Click that one down and make sure that you're on the settings tab. Get down to grid and click in the choice that says block grid right there. Why this? Well, the block grid is a good way to work with the software and know more about how big a model is going to be within the Minecraft space. Because if we close this one right now, if we click that one in, close this, you'll see that we get a few different squares around here. Each of these squares represent the size of a Minecraft block, which is good to know. So if our model is here and it's smaller than this, it's going to be smaller than a Minecraft block in size. And that's why I usually try to add that or at least instruct people in adding that option to the viewport. So if you enable that, now you know a bit more about where your model is. So how to navigate the viewport? If we left click, hold left click and drag, we can rotate in our view by just pulling the mouse around. As long as you're holding left click, you can move. If you let go and move, you'll move the mouse. Left click and move, rotate, left click and move without holding. Well, not, <laughs> not left clicking, of course, letting go of the key. You'll be able to move the mouse around again. Right, you got that down, left click, rotate, let go, move around. If we were to right click instead, we'll now move the floor. And why do I call this the floor? Well, it's essentially representing the very ground surface in a Minecraft world. This field right here is the ground surface. Or everything that is put on the line of this field will be on the ground surface. So, moving this around, doo -doo 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 -doo. don't have to move it that fast, but holding a right click on your mouse, and then moving and dragging with your mouse will allow you to move the viewport like this. Left click to rotate, right click to move, 
and don't any one of them in order to move the mouse freely, right? But that is only when you're in this viewport, because as soon as you move outside of it, you can't left click and drag, you right click and drag, it won't do anything, right? If you're in this viewport. But also know that when you have clicked in this viewport, you can drag the mouse outside of it and still affect it. Because it basically reads the space of your computer, right? You can see that? I'm holding and dragging. Same thing for the move. Holding and dragging, holding and dragging. Back on screen. Now, if you were to accidentally lose this view, if you were to pull it away, it's gone. We can click on the little, little, small three buttons up here and say center view on selection. We will bring back the view to the center of a screen. And with the scroll wheel, we can zoom in and zoom out. Zoom in and zoom out. Have you gotten that so far? Good. Now, those are the very fundamentals of how to work your way around the Blockbench interface. In the next episode, we're going to look into how to put down your very first cube and put a texture onto it. I hope that you have managed to put some interest into the software already. Now, make sure that you click around and drag a bit and play around with the interface, look into some of these things, create a new project for example, save your project and just to get used to the workflow of it, okay? And I'll see you in the next clip. Hi and welcome back into Blockbench. I am Kevin, a texture artist and model designer animator for the Minecraft Marketplace. I am here today with another episode on how to work your way around in Blockbench and this is a beginner level Blockbench tutorial. In this episode, we're going to work with putting down a block in the space and try to understand on how to move and navigate the block and also how to size and put the block in certain positions. So let's get cracking with it. In the outliner here to our right, we can create a new element. What is a new element? Well, glad that you asked. If you go to this little square right here that when I hover it says add cube, you will create a cube in this space on the left. Okay, let's do that. Click and ta-da, there's the block. This is a very small block and because we have set the texture of this document to be 16 by 16, this block is always going to be auto-generated into a 16 by 16 block surface per edge that it's based on. And that size is based on the square that we have right here. This square represents the 16 by 16 resolution. So if something is smaller than that, it will only use a surface of the 16 by 16 square space. This is maybe a bit overkill, but we'll come to that in a future episode. Don't worry about it. So to get started and getting cracking with working with our cube, we should know something about the 3D workspace and viewport. In the first episode, I taught you a bit about how to move your things around here. By left clicking and holding and dragging, we can rotate. By right clicking and holding and dragging, we can move the space. To work with the very block itself that we have here, the cube or the element has to be said, we can work with the tools move, resize, rotate, pivot tool, and vertices snap. But we would prefer to work with the move tool for today, or right now at least. Not sure why it has selected the move tool. Okay, right, do we have it? So the move tool allows us to move this little cube in the space. We have the red angle, which is representing east and west, because we have the north sign here. You see the N here with the arrow, that is always north. If you create a character in this environment, you would have their face face in the north direction. Then it would also spawn in and work appropriately within the Minecraft space. Good to know, small information. Regardless, we have north, we have east, west, and we have south. Also, we have up and down. So this block can, if I were to hover over one of these arrows and hold left click, you get this red line, knowing now that I'm moving across the horizontal line of east and west, be dragged and pulled into new snap locations. Du -du 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 -du, like this. I'll leave it by the middle again. Same thing goes for north and south. Du -du -du, like this, drag and pull. And we have up and down. Good. You got that? Try it out again. West or east, west, yes. South, north, up, down. Now, if we were to accidentally relocate this somewhere we're not sure where we're supposed to go, you can look at the values out here, the position values. These are currently telling us where in this space this block is. Okay, so by the x axis, the red one, or east and west axis, it's minus five blocks. Aha! That means that it's currently resting on the 4th or 5th block 
to our west. We're going to go north like that. Well, you know, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's resting on the fifth block, minus five. And if we were to look at the coordinates of, well, you know, the green arrow, up and down, well, couldn't we argue that it's kind of like five blocks up? Let's see. Four, three, two, one, and zero. Yeah, we're correct. Five blocks up. And if we were to look at the coordinates of north and south, the blue line, it seems as if it's just on this tangent line right here. And that means that we are on 8 from the center. Because if we were to be on minus 8, all the way over here, we would instead be on this square. Now, why is it that the cube is inside of this square when it's on minus 8, but outside of this square when it's on plus 8? That is because of this translation point right here. This is the pivot position of this block. What a pivot is, is essentially a target space location for the very block itself that tells it on what angle it can rotate around, from where it's translated in terms of position in the world, and where to snap with things. So if I were to take rotate, you could see that the rotation seems to lock around this pivot point. Instead of, as we when we were moving, looking around the center of the block. Same thing goes for resize, it also goes with the center. But as I said, rotate moves with the pivot. If I were to do the rotate one, we see these handles here, the slightly fatter areas on the circle fields. We hold and left click on that, drag and pull, you can see that it rotates, and it rotates around this very axis point. Same thing with the green one, rotate around this axis point. Same thing for this one. To move this axis point, we would normally go and click on pivot right here. What's interesting about the pivot right now is if I go to move again, I can't move the pivot because the pivot point itself is only moved and affected within the pivot setting here. Now I can move the pivot point. I can make it snap to this corner, this corner, this corner, or this corner even back where we were in the beginning. I could also center it to this object by clicking this thing right here. Center pivot. You can see? Over up to the right, center pivot. Hmm. And now it's in the middle of it. You can see that by the red, blue, and green line passing through the object. If I were now to relocate this object to the very core center of the workspace by taking the position values or by either then clicking on these two value sliders on left and right, or value buttons you could say, that either adds plus one or minus one to the value, I could click my way all the way down to zero, or I can mark the value with my left click, add a zero with my keyboard keys, and click enter, and it will also be put down that location. But this makes no sense, because the pivot point isn't at the core center of this one, it doesn't really seem like it's actually being located where it's supposed to be. So we're going to move the pivot back to the center, like that. Now it's where it originally sat on this block. Hmm. But it makes really no sense. This block wouldn't be centered unless it was super centered, would it? Well, if we hold shift, you can snap move an object in a fourth of a block snap space. Same thing if I hold shift again and drag this direction. Now the block is located at the very, 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 very center. And you can see how the pivot is not. It was 05, so we have to put that one at center. Now it's the pivot on the center of this block. We don't want to work with that though. We would like to instead use the resize tool, because we're going to create a Minecraft block here. So we're going to take the resize tool, take this location right here, drag that all the way out by holding left click. Same thing on this side, drag it all the way out. Now, why can't I just use one of them and drag on both sides at the same time? Because this one, can only be dragged as far as the element on the other side is pulled. It essentially pulls the outer side of that block side for each individual side. So this one knows that it pulls this element back and forth. It can't go through itself because that would make the block inverted. We can't do inverted blocks in Minecraft or in this texture space. We could do it with textures, but that's another episode. We're going to pull this one out as well and this one out as well. Now I know for fact 
that this space is 16 by 16, or at least the square right here is 16 by 16 long. We could tell that from the beginning when we move the object out 8 this direction and minus 8 this direction. From 0 is plus 8 and minus 8. Together, plus 8 and minus 8 has a distance of 16 in between them. And lo and behold, when we look at the size values, we can see that the size for our left to or west to east is 16. Our size for our north to south is 16. Would make sense then to change our size for up and down to 16 as well. And there we have it. It's a cube. Now, let's add a texture to this cube. To add a texture, I go to the texture field out to the left. I click create texture and I take the texture name and call it the same thing, hello, as we did with the block initially in our first episode. You don't necessarily have to do this right now, but it could be good to know that you can do that for future reference. We let's click in template and confirm. Let's unclick power of two size and confirm. Power of two is essentially just adding four squares that is texture size instead of one. I'll tell you a bit more about what that is about in a second. Confirm, don't change anything else. Okay, so what were we faced with here? As you can tell, all sides on the box now has different colors instead of just one color, which maybe would make more sense, I guess. But when I told the texture itself right here with the properties, well, not the properties like that, if I were to create a new texture, template. When I told it to be a template, what Blockbench did was to add this square design to each side with like an outline and an inner color, which goes for each individual side of the square. Now, what can we tell by looking at what this model is currently become? If we were to go into paint up here on the right, you see how I pull my nose up here, paint, click that. You have the texture showing up here to the left. Now, what it has done, and what you need to know about textures on 3D objects, is that a texture, it's a 2D flat image that is added, or a part of it is added, to a surface on a model. So if you see a human in a game, for example, their entire skin has been cut in pieces and put flat on a picture. And that looks really weird. Let me add an overlay for that. So yeah, same thing goes here. What we have done is to take all individual surfaces or faces, the north, south, east, west, up and down faces of this model and given them a unique texture face. Thus, as you can also tell, the texture that we said to be 16 by 16 is essentially now 64 by 64. Weird, but that makes sense because this square is 16 by 16. And if we were to look at how this is put together, and then think 16 by 16 times 4, that is 64. 16, 32, 48, 64. So now it makes sense that it's suddenly 64 by 64. And if I were to go and select black, you can select color in this space, by the way, by clicking anywhere with your left mouse button while hovering that space. You can also select a different color hue by going into this bar on the right and selecting with your left click. I would like to go with orange. Yeah, I like orange. It's one of my favorite colors. I'm going to select a bright, sharp orange. Not necessarily too bright, but this one will do. I'm going to go into paint bucket and I'm going to apply that on this blue face by clicking on it. Wow, interesting. Can you do the same thing by clicking up here in the left face? Well, you could. Let's do it. Oh, okay. That's an interesting one. Why did it do that? Well, the paint bucket tool, and I just did control Z for you to know that. You can also do this again and click on edit and undo. Know that? Fill, edit, undo. Or redo if you want to put it back again, but I'm gonna undo. Essentially, Blockbench knows if you are hovering one of these faces with your paint bucket, it knows that this face alone is only reaching to this edge. So if I paint bucket this face, it's only going to cover that face with, with that paint. Same thing goes with here, same thing goes with here and here and here. Now I've painted all of the faces in here, and how would I know where is where? Where is north? Where is south? What is what face? I just knew a second ago. Well, if I were to go back into edit, I can rotate around and look for north. Okay, so that's north. That is my north. Go back into paint. Now I know that this face is north. So let's add a happy little smile on that face. I'm gonna go with the black, drag and pull, and then make a little bit of an eye. Make a little bit of another eye here. And a little bit of a happy face. And I think a happy face looks a bit like this. 
Ah, it's a bit derpy. Yeah, but it's cute. Maybe it has some eyebrows. This could be a pumpkin. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you do a pumpkin like that, but yeah, you could. So that happens when we have different faces on all sides. But what if I wanted to have all sides being the same face? Just use a tick 16 by 16 space, space area. Well, first of all, I would go into File, Project, and where we have set box, text, uh, box UV, I would untick that square, Confirm. Now you can see that all of the different sides of the box, like we said, north, south, west, east, up and down, have been given its own space on this texture field. How do I know that? Well, I do know that for <laughs> just because of experience. But all you need to know is that if you have the 64 by 64 created before here and you go into resize, tell it to be 16 by 16 instead. Confirm. You knew that? You have the texture. Right click, resize and write 16 by 16 into each of these. Height and width. And confirm. Fill with transparent. I could also fill it with a color. Why not? It doesn't really matter in this case. Now, all of these sides will still be located on a 64 by 64 map. So anything that was outside of the top left corner will not be visible on texture size. How to get that working? Well, if you click on this paint bucket right here, it will auto apply this face to everything. Well, will it really? Doesn't seem like it. But if we maximize the UV first and then click, it, how do we know? Well, one way to find out is to pick the paint bucket on the surface. Lo and behold, it seems like it's applied to all of our faces. How now do I know if this one is the same for all other spaces in the field? Well, let's take a slightly brighter color than the black. Pull it by the edge right this. Make a square within the square. Da, 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 da. With the color picker tool, if I select that, I can select a color on the field like that, and it will auto change into that color. If I were to select this one, you can see that it picks in between gray, black. I will use the black to paint over these two ones that I accidentally put down at the bottom. And I want to continue with a slightly brighter color. So I'm going to pick the brightest color I had and push this one even slightly brighter. Continue painting that square in the middle of this one. Like that. Well, I'll go over that hole in a second. You don't have to be perfect. I could just fill in all of this if I wanted to, but it's kind of fun to have you watch and follow in the progression. Right, go with that. If I were to scroll out now and look around, well, lo and behold, it seems like all the faces got the very same texture. And this is usually how a Minecraft block is texture. It uses the same space on the canvas for all the faces at the same time. Are you with me on that one? Glad you enjoyed. So this is how you put down a bit of a Minecraft texture approach in the early beginnings. I know this episode is very much longer than the first one and it goes into a lot more and probably some of you are really tired by now, but I also guess that you maybe got some information out on how to play around with this software. Not everyone is, uh, everything is straightforward and I hope that I can come back and revisit this development course in the future and make an even better version of it. But for now, I hope that you enjoyed watching and listening. And in the next one, we're going to develop a snowman. It's a slightly more complicated texture. We'll also use the block space UV to create the snowman texture. So let's jump into that. See you next one. Hi and welcome back into Blockbench. I am Kevin, a texture artist, Blockbench model designer and of course also an animator for the Minecraft Marketplace. And in this episode of Blockbench Modeling, which is still somewhat a series for beginner, we are going to work on a slightly more advanced model than just a regular Minecraft block. However, in comparison to last episode, we will use the block UV setting or the box UV setting when we are starting our project. So let's get going. First up, we develop a bedrock model. We start that up in our new project. Complete a new project from the get-go. We're gonna call this one Snowman. Snow, no man, snowman. Cause why not? We'll leave the box UV checked in. We'll leave the texture width, doesn't really matter. Cause we're not gonna work too much on texture resolution at this point still. Let's confirm that. Okay, the file is begun. Now, I know for a fact that a snowman has more than one cube to it, so let's start by adding a cube. I'm gonna hold ALT, cause an interesting part about the ALT key on your keyboard is when you have the resize tool, for example, and hold ALT, it'll allow you to move back into the move tool. And if you hold the move tool and click on ALT, you'll get back into the resize tool. If you hold the rotate tool and hold ALT, it'll get you back into the move tool. 
or sorry, move the pivot tool. And the same thing for the pivot tool, it gets you back into the rotation tool. These are all interesting things to know. But when I work on a model, I usually have move selected and I hold alt, the alt key on my keyboard, in order to get the resize uh, setting for when I'm working. So I'm going to pull this out to somewhere where I think the base of the uh, this snowman makes good sense. This snowman is going to be three cubes in size. So let's see, this one is 14 by 14. I can look over here to see that it's 14 by 14. Okay, let's get going. Now, there are two ways I can go about this. I can either now create a new cube by clicking add cube, or I can hold control and click B, which will duplicate this cube, or right click this cube with my mouse and click on duplicate. What this has done now is essentially create a second cube that is the very same size and proportions of the one cube we just had. So if I were now to click on the move tool and pull this up, you can see that I have a second cube now floating in there above the first one. Let's work with this one. I'm going to pull it down so that it faces and aligns just on the very face with the first cube. I'm going to go within my resize tool by holding alt from the move tool and then just ever so slightly size this cube in to a good space. Okay, so it's now 10, 10, so this one should be 10 as well. Don't want the snowman to be inappropriately sized. Okay, let's do that again. But in this case, I'm going to do the Control D key. Control D, pull up, and then potentially also shrink this cube once more. Like that. And like so. That's a cute little snowman, I guess. Now, if you have ever seen a snowman, you know that a snowman is not usually just this. But for the sake of it, let's start with this and see what we can do. So I'm going to start and add a texture to it. We go to the create texture. We go to template. We call this one snow man, like before. Confirm. Good. Uh, desel dis disable the power of two size. I'm not sure how many times I had to say that, but every once in a while you get stutter. And now it is applied a different texture space to all our faces. I go into paint and now you can see that all of the different cubes, you have the bigger cube at the bottom, you have the lesser cube here and the smallest cube here, have their very own areas in this. I know now that I want the snowman to be white. So I'm going to select a very white color, not necessarily completely super white, and I am going to paint bucket on all of these spaces by clicking on one surface, holding down left key, and then just dragging my paint bucket around. Thus I can paint all of them. I'm going to rotate around by clicking outside the model, holding left to rotate and drag, click on one surface and then just hold down and drag. And same thing with clicking in the bottom. If you look on the texture to our left here, there are two squares that apparently hasn't received the white color. Can you guess which squares these are? Well, if I were to go back into edit, now it goes quicker this time. Pull up, pull up. You can see that the bottom of these two blocks has that square each. Well, because they won't be seen, they also don't receive any texture color. So a way to work around this, if we go back into paint, is to today, and this is going to be an interesting one, we're going to use the copy paste tool. This allows us to remove faces if we want them from a texture space. So I'm going to click the copy paste tool. Now in this window right here, we can, if we hold control, scroll. Yeah, you heard me. You can scroll and zoom in and zoom out. Test that. Hold control, scroll in, zoom in, zoom out. You'll zoom wherever your cursor is currently located. So if I locate my cursor here, I'll zoom in there. If I locate my cursor here, I'll zoom in there. If I locate my cursor up here, I'll zoom in there. Move out and zoom like that. So we're going to zoom in just that uh, we have this one right here. And scrolling up and down while not holding control will, of course, allow you to move up and down like here. If you move up just above this here, you'll see there's a small blue bar. If I were to pull that one, I can move right to left. Now, with the copy paste tool, I can click with my left mouse up in the very left corner, click like that, drag all the way down to the right corner and let go. Now, as you can see, we have a square selection. There's a scissor down here. This scissor allows us to cut out this very field essentially removing it from the texture, but also essentially letting us paste it somewhere else if we wanted to. I'm not going to paste this one though, I'm just going to cut it so that it disappears. Right, and now I'm going to move over to the other one that we have down here. And you can do that by scrolling with control, zoom out and zoom in, move, 
and then left click and drag, left click and drag, and scissor out. Now those faces won't be seen, and we can go back into edit like we did before, lift this one up now, and you can see that suddenly it's hollow underneath. It doesn't have that square that we had before. This is a way to optimize your texture so they don't hold necessarily informa like unnecessary information. Okay, so the snowman is here. What side is north again? Do you remember that? Well, we are in edit, right? Ah, there is the north. So this is where our face should be on the snowman. Okay, let's go into paint. Let's work with a slightly darker color, because I know that snowmans are usually put with like some rocks on the front. Hmm, one like there maybe. Maybe one like there, maybe one like there. Uh, some smaller ones up here, because why not? And then he has like two eyes. And then a carrot. Hmm, this is interesting. Where would the carrot go? I don't really see a good space for the carrot. Should I just take an orange color and do that? Like so? I could. Doesn't look that bad. It's a good way to do a simplistic snowman. And what if I wanted to have arms? Well, I could paint them. Select the slightly darker orange, because that will get you down to brown. Then select the space like this. And drag. And then paint some fingers. And then paint like this. And then some finger like that. Okay. Well, it seems like the snowman has some fingers now on an arm that is painted onto the body. But it still looks like snow. Wait a second. Well, we have to paint another arm. Now I'll teach you another interesting tool that you can work with when you're painting within Blockbench. Let's go Ctrl Z or undo up here all the way back to where we don't have that arm again. Or if you're used to this area, know that this field will not apply anywhere else. You can also color pick, paint bucket, and then just paint over it and we'll get rid of it. So let's select another brown again. Now, this time, I'm going to go to the setting up here doo -doo -doo -doo, called Mirror Painting. Mirror Painting allows me to paint on one side based off of the center of our editing surface, which is based on this coordinate right here. That's the very center of our working space. And have anything that is on this side that has a side here be painted at the same time. As long as this one is sticked in. Taking it out, taking it in. So let's see what happens when I take it in. I paint here. Wait a second. Can you see now that there appears a line here, but also a line over here? Let me do that again. Keep an eye over here. Not drag. Ah. Oh, interesting. So this is the mirror painting tool. If I were now to rotate this snowman. Ah, there's paint here as well. Interesting. So let's just continue pulling all the arm out, right? Like that. And under the finger like that. Like so. Now, I'm hoping that you're enjoying this series as much as I do. But as much as I'm helping you out here as a beginner, I would also like you to help me out in return. If you can leave a like and a comment on this video telling me about what you would like to see next or know more about within Blockbench so that I can niche these videos to you, make them more accessible and more valuable for you as the viewer, the better it is for me as well. I'm happy to do that, and it would be so fun. If you have any other suggestions or requests, tell me either here on YouTube in the comment fields or on my Reddit page at Arts by Kev. And if you're a subscriber of this channel, I can't thank you enough. It makes me so happy to see that people are interested and want to learn more about the modeling and stuff that goes into Minecraft, because Minecraft has been one of the very core games of my entire youth and upbringing. It's one of the things that I play the most, having run a network and stuff with friends. I really love this game, and I would like to see more people have fun and explore and express themselves within it as well. That is not just tied to the marketplace, that is also tied into just working and developing your own experience, having fun with it, seeing what you can do. So I try to break the limits and push the potentials. In the next episode, we're gonna hyper upgrade the snowman and make him really, really dope. But I'll see you there. Hi and welcome back to Blockbench. I am Kevin and in this episode we are gonna hyper upgrade the snowman. Let's push the limits of this guy and see how much cooler we can make him now when we do know a bit on how to work our way around Blockbench. I've given you the basics in a few episodes now on how to model, how to texture and how to put something together from the very basis up. And in this episode we're gonna continue down that line by starting with removing the texture that we had the last time. Now looking at this blob right here. When we are working with 3D, we are essentially trying to understand what something will look like before it's actually given a proper texture, before it has phases, before it has limbs, motions and whatnot. 
and that is done by breaking it apart into components we can easily understand. I'm going to move these two blocks up a bit and I'm also going to hide them in my viewer by clicking on the eyes right here, not the big one at the bottom but the upper ones. This bigger block I would now try to make slightly rounder than the last time and the way to do that would be to try to add a few more extra cubes on the sides. So what I'm going to do is to shrink it in one block back and one block front, one block bottom and one block top. Like that. I'm now going to create a duplicate of this block, size it all the way down to the very top, shrink it in one, shrink it in one. And then duplicate that one as well and bring it down to the bottom. Now I'm going to duplicate the big block again, put it one block forth, shrink it all the way down so it's one block uh, wide, down in, down in. Duplicate that and bring it to the back. If you were to look at this now, you can see that this is feeling ever so slightly rounder than the big square. And that's because we have managed to round off the corners. They're no longer pointy. If I could do this one more time, then maybe this one would look even more round. There are two things to think of here, and that is gravity and flow. Gravity on this snowman wouldn't make it so that it's maybe necessarily rounder at the bottom. Because it has to stand on something. So I'm going to leave the bottom surface this big and this flat. But the front and the sides, I would like them to be slightly more round. So I'm going to duplicate another face, bring it forth, bring it in two now on each side, and back and bottom and top as well. And then give a duplication to that. Same thing goes for this big block right here, which remember from before. Pull. Pull it all the way in like that. And then two block in, two block, two block, uh, two block. Sorry, like that and like that. Duplicate it and bring it to the other side. If you are any in any way, shape, or form familiar to Minecraft uh, spheres and building like circles with squares, you also kind of know the math that goes into that. And knowing that by increasing the distance, you'll get like a bit of a curve. You can see there's a slight curve here over the angle. This is much more round than what we had initially, right? Now I can continue working with this the very same way for the next two cubes. So let's start by adding back the other cube we had. Now this cube is already slightly smaller than the one that is below, so we can work with this one from the get-go. I'm going to duplicate it, bring it in ever so slightly, shrink it in one on this side, duplicate that, bring it over to this side, and then do the same thing with the big one again. Put it all the way back in so it's one block, as you can see, one block thick. Like that. When I say one block, of course I mean one pixel. But I am calculating these cubes as block for myself within this workspace because they are blocks in the space itself. Now we have a slightly rounder version of that. You can grab another copy of this one, shrink it down two, 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 and two. And same thing over here. Right, back, front, do the same thing. Not that, but this one. Like so and duplicate and pull to the back. If you've seen some of the other episodes and you suddenly considered that it's moving way faster, it's because I am now showing you slightly more of my workflow speed compared to before. When working and instructing somebody, you can't go too fast. You kind of have to respect their speed at the given time. And that is what I prefer to do. I've been a teacher in the past and for me it's important that people are still hanging along. So that's also taking a pause right now to give you some time to catch up. Are you with me on this one? Have you managed to pull all the spaces? It is looking slightly more round. If I look from this side, it's slightly more round like that. That's a cool effect. Whee! Same thing here. Whee! Okay, regardless, can't do that all the day. And now I also know that we need to add a head. Of course, I would like this head to be slightly bigger than that. It's a very small snowman head. It's almost hmm, gimmicky small. Let's make it slightly bigger. Let's make it, yeah, slightly bigger. But on this head, just like on this one, which I didn't do with this cube, because I'm considering that this snowball is slightly shoved into the lower one. I would like this one to slightly, to rest slightly more on the top. So I'm going to add a one block thick cube like that, or rectangle or block, whatever you'd call it, uh, depending on who you are and what approach you take to, to Minecraft. And I'm going to do that. And now you can see that it's just slightly block bigger on that one. Yeah, on all sides, seems like it's completely correct square sized as well good 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 we can take that by saying size 888 good but would i like to have something on the top of my snowman hmm. usually people add clothing to their snowman 
And I would like to do that with this one, in one way or another. And I've thought two ideas. One idea is to add a hat. The other idea is to add a scarf. If I were to add the scarf, it wouldn't necessarily make too much sense having all of this detail in the middle. If I were to add a hat, I could just build that on top. But I also know that this snowman needs a carrot nose. So we'll get to that in a second. Let's copy this small object and put it on the side of the head. Increase by one like this. Duplicate to the other side. Take the same thing here, do that, because this is going to go on the face now. It has to be well thought of when working with faces, because a face in Minecraft can look weird when you have it sitting on the very angle of something. But we'll work with this for now. And we'll leave the top. Yeah, or no, actually, we'll bring one block on the top, so it has a slightly more round approach. As you can see now, this entire model is much rounder than the first snowman we had. I'm gonna add him on screen somewhere around here so you can take a look. It is much rounder, and it already says more with its silhouette, which essentially means the shadow or the shape that the outlines of the model is producing in comparison to the first one we had. This one is more round, essentially. So, now I also know that I need to add a nose. So, if I were to first locate north, North is over here. Aha, uh -huh, okay. So this is our front side. On this side is where the face is going to go. So if I want to add the nose, I'll bring something out like this. Maybe like a dot. Shrink it in a bit. Do I want it to be too thick? Yeah, carrot is slightly thicker at the very bottom. And it might be slightly slimmer at the tip. So I'm going to do that. Duplicate. And now I'm going to shrink this one into one block. But that doesn't look too cool, does it? Not necessarily. So let's make it one smaller. And now, holding shift, I will move this piece in a decrease of a fourth of one of these squares in movement in the space. Right, so holding shift, I can now click and drag and it moves it so it's now centered at the bottom. Aha. Uh -huh. Centered at the top. Oh, that's kind of cool. Now you can also see that the tapering of this carrot is occurring. That's an interesting effect, and that's the effect that I would go for. It's also the effect that I wanted to have in the beginning. Okay, but there's another thing that I'm thinking of that might be cool to do. And that is, and now we're going to work with the pivot a bit. I'm going to bring out a copy of the carrot root base. Bring that one in ever so slightly. Pull this one, and pull this one. Now I'm going to go into the pivot tool. And I'm going to center the pivot on this object right here, and then pull it all the way to the back where that nose was, and then pull it up to the very top corner. Why would I do that? Well, if you've seen any of the episodes, you do know that the pivot tool is essentially a location where we can rotate things around. Mm -hmm. So if I were to click on rotate right now, you can see that the rotation is occurring around this axis. If I were to rotate, I can rotate both of these ones from this origin point. Why would I do that? Well, I don't consider all carrots to be completely straight. Or, well, depends on, well, yeah. And one cool way to do this could potentially be to make it so that the carrot is leaning somewhat. It's a slightly bendy carrot. You could do the same thing with the pivot in this one. I tried to move it in such a way that I can rotate it to point a bit upwards. Now that's a weird carrot. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it works for our situation. I'll just pull it downwards. Nah, I could do that as well. I'm going to leave the pivot up here though. And then just pull the carrot ever so slightly down. That's a very moopy carrot. Hmm. Not sure that would go with that. So, this is a secondary point you'll come to when you're working on a model. As in compared to before, when I've been very secure and said, this is how we do this, how we do this, how we do. Even when you're working with a model, you have to be open to make decisions on the fly. So now I know that that is necessarily not what I want. I can then instead choose to move the pivot point of this front block further ahead down to where that block location is by doing the tools, as I said before. And then by selecting these two together, you can see that I can't necessarily rotate them. They have a different idea of where they want to go. But I can rotate this one first and then rotate this one on its behalf and then move it into location. Now I can tell you another tool that you can use, and that is when you hold shift for move. As I said before, it snaps at the different size. If you hold control, it snaps at a one point size instead. You can see there on the position up here, it moves 0.1. It moves 0.25, moves 0.1. 
And that allows me to, with a more precise precision, put this carrot bending top somewhere else on the model. So that's the one I'm going to put right there. And it goes like that. There is also a little bit of a texture glitch you should be aware of here, and it's right here. When I scroll out, you can see like how this gray is kind of tuning through and this blue is tuning over. It has to do with the fact that the two faces, the two surfaces, are on top of one another at the very same coordinate. The program doesn't necessarily know exactly which one it's supposed to show first. And thus we'll get this weird blend where it's kind of like spassing out. One way to get around this is to paint both of these two areas in the same color. Thus it won't be visible in the game. But another way to work around it is to increase the size of this by a tool called Inflate. That's a tool that I'm not going to use for this video, but it could be nice to know that it's there. So, we have this. Hmm, now I'm also thinking that maybe I would like to rotate the very, very root of the, the carrot. And to do that, I'm going to select all of these th three carrot elements. The one at the very top is this one. It has a pivot that's not necessarily the best position, so I'm going to put that at the very top of the carrot root. Move back into move, and I'm going to add a group. I've selected this block right here, that has the people here, and add a group on top of that. This group is now going to inherit this pivot location, like that. So this bone right here is brought up. Is this the cube we're working with? Nope. Is this the cube? This is the cube. Okay, good. If we were to select the bone and pivot, you see that the pivot snap is at this location, even though the cube itself, or the bone itself, is telling us that it's in the center of the model, all of the model spaces. But the pivot is up here at the nose. Then we take the first cube, pull it down below the other cubes, and then we mark all of them by either holding control or clicking one, holding shift and clicking the rest. Or the very bottom, we'll select everything in between. We left click hold and drag on top of that until you see this little icon that gives you a number of how many blocks you're going to add into that bone or this folder. And you'd pull and drop and they're now in that folder. If I were to select this folder, not the folder alone, but the folders that I have all of these elements selected at the same time, by clicking on that folder. If you were to click on the, one of the bones on the, on the cubes underneath, it will deselect the folder. If you want to click on the folder again, it'll select only the folder. You can't rotate only the folder. It won't make change unless you're an animate. But you can rotate the folder in here. And this can mainly and only be done for Bedrock Edition. If you were to do this for Java Edition, it'll probably squeal a bit. So if I have all of them selected, I can go into Rotate. And then rotate the nose slightly further down. Oh, this is a very, very, very sad snowman. But it's a fun sad snowman though, because I guess it could be a witch or something when we're done. Okay, let's now add an arm. And I would like to do the arm as to say, like the same way as I've done with the bone here. But I would also, now when I have the option to do so, add all of these extra elements into bones. Hmm, interesting. So by pulling all of these elements at the top, adding a group around them. I now have, as you can see here by the pivot at the base, a group for the head. So I could rotate this entire piece all at once. Hmm, interesting. I'm going to take the bone of the nose and pull in to this group as well. So we're going to rename this group by right clicking it, click rename, into head. We're going to re rename this one into nose. Hope you're with me on this one. If it's going too fast, you can just pause the video and try to figure out how I did. Right click, rename, right click, rename. And then by clicking one of these arrows, we shrink the groups. We don't see of the other extra blocks that's in that one. Now we're going to do the same thing with this. We're going to select all of the blocks that are on this part of the body, which is the central part. Okay. Add group around that. We're going to call this mid. And the very bottom then are the rest of the blocks, I would assume. Yeah, seems very accurate. Okay, add a bone that. That's called base. So we have head mid base. It would make sense that, judging by the coordinates, that the head itself is stuck to the mid. So that whenever we move the mid, if we were to move mid, the head follows and the nose follows because the nose is within the head. And the mid then is dragged so that it's added into the base. Now, if we were to move the base, the mid would follow. Make sense? Good. Now, I'm also going to add a top of this that is called root. Another file folder that is basically going to be the, the, the parent for base. So that the root folder has no loose 
elements moving about in it. So it's root, base, mid, head, and nose. Now I also know that if I'm going to make arms, they're probably going to be added in the mid section. So let's crack in with getting an arm on this guy. For this, I've decided to move the model slightly to the left, and I'm going to add a folder or a group that I'm going to call left arm. I would like this one to look a bit intimidating, so we're going to see if we can add some cool angles and potentially something else to the model. And now also keep in mind that at this current point in time, we don't necessarily know what the guy is going to look like in the end. We've added textures to it. We kind of just have to work with the, with the shape of it. So I'm going to add a cube to that. The left arm is now going to be moved all the way up where I think the left arm would be fitting in position. And I think that's about right there. Okay, we can see that the cube is following along because we're moving the group. And the cube then would be positioned, let's hold shift, let's hold shift again, so that it's in the center of where the pivot is. Yep, you can see that, you see the, how the pivot is behind here, if I were to select that one, it's at the very center of that. On, yep, good, good, good. Which also means that if I were to rotate the group, it would rotate around the location where it snapped onto the body. Good. So let's size out the arm a bit. Like so, let's duplicate that element. And now let's change the pivot point of this particular element so that that one is set to snap around here. I think that's good. Mm. Yeah, I could work with that. What I would like to do as well for this one is to have this to become a proper shoulder limb. Not shoulder limb, but elbow limb, yeah. So I've got another group that I'm calling elbow, or left elbow even. And the reason why I'm naming these left is because there's a cool thing that Blockbench does when you duplicate something that allows you essentially to work around. And it just renames things that are on the left side to the right side if you copy and flip them. And we'll do that, trust me, because this arm is going to be modeled on the left side and then I'll show you how to do the rest. So we have that right there, we're going to duplicate another one. And this is where the fun and interesting thing comes. So now I'm going to figure out what I want the hand to look like. And what does a hand look like? If you were to look at your hand from the very bottom up, let's take the left hand. You can see how the arm connects onto the outer side of your hand. And then it goes up a bit for the thumb and it continues to the pointy fingers, right? So this would kind of make sense for the hand, for the snowman, if I wanted to add fingers to it. So let's do that. I'm going to pull out a finger here. And I'm going to pull out like a, a finger copy here. And then, of course, potentially a thumb as well. That's going to go like here. I think two fingers is good enough. But I'm also going to have to move the pivot of the, of the thumb so that it's more in line with where I think it should move from. Which would be somewhere around there. Okay, now I also think that it would be cool to have more motion to the very timber, uh, the fingertips of this guy. And I think that it's good if he's kind of creepy. So I'm going to increase the finger length ever so slightly. I'll have a longer pointy finger for that. And now we have to make bones around this. Because trust me, I'm planning on animating this. So we have the hand. We're going to call this one left hand. Like so. We're going to have that cube into there. Now we can double check that the pivot is in the right position. Yep, very correct. And now this is the finger, so left pinky will be that one, and that's that. Yep, we'll select this cube and call it left pointy, because why not? We'll pull that into cube into that one, and this one will be left thumb. Now do note that whenever I wanted to create a new uh, group, I selected the previous element, thus keeping the pivot at the location of that element. Good. Because I were to select this group right now and rotate, it's there. This one, it's there. Uh, this one, it's there. Hand, well, yes, of course. We can't leave the pinkies and thumbs and pointies outside of the hand. We need to add them in. So one by one, we're going to drag them into underneath here. Like so. Well, come on, you as well. Good. I think it makes more sense to have the, the thumb at the bottom, top. Just in hierarchy. Thumb, pointy, pinky. Now I would like to add a tip to each of these two or like three fingers, so I'm going to go with the thumb tip. So we'll duplicate that thumb, move it in so that it's shielded to itself. We'll rename this file to left thumb tip. We're going to do the same thing with the pointy finger. We're going to pull it back into there. We're going to rename it into left pointy tip. And same thing with the pinky. 
gonna rename it into left pinky tip okay good pull it back in and of course we have to relocate these files so they're in the right spot like where they're actually gonna go uh, and I think that the point for that one is going to be slightly longer. Same thing for this one. And for the thumb, of course, it also has to go out a bit and it's going to be slightly longer. I have no idea if this is going to look cool or not, but I guess it may be probably well. Maybe probably well. It's a good way to look at things. So let's see here. Do -do -do -do. Pivot there. Yeah, good. Of course, we're going to move the cube. Do -do 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 -do. That thumb. Uh, well, um, do we want it? Yeah, I want it to be slightly longer. So I'm going to do that. We're going to move the tip out one. Good. That's better. Now let's check what happens a bit if we were to select the thumb, rotate it, select the pointy and rotate it slightly, select the pointy tip and rotate it. Does this feel right? Yeah, I'd say that this actually feels a bit like a finger. It lacks one top limb for the for the fingers, but I think three will work all fine. Oh, what happened there, you say? How come I can suddenly see the model like this? Well, when clicking control Z, I forgot to hold control, and I just clicked the Z key. The Z key allows me to see the model as this outline and hollow object, which just shows me all of the faces. Z moves back and forth between that. We have a wireframe, and we have a non-wireframe view. Good to know. Glad that I accidentally did it by mistake. Sometimes mistakes are happy accidents. So now we have the left arm here. I'm going to add that left arm into our mid folder. Now, how did I do that with that ease? I clicked on the file folder, held left, uh, left uh, on the mouse, and scrolled wheel my way around the list. You can't do this in most programs, but you can do it in Blockbench, which is amazing. So good to know. It's in the mid right there. And now as well, I'm going to duplicate this arm and put it on the other side. But it wouldn't be optimal for the textures if I did that, considering I want this arm to use the same textures on both sides. So I'm going to leave this arm out for now, well, the other arm, and we're going to come back to that in the next episode, where I'm going to put out the textures and try to work out on just some, some last finishing touches for this model. I might add some more between episodes, but regardless, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Leave a thumbs up if you did. A thumbs sl up, slop, up. Yeah, that. I guess. And of course, tell me down in the comments, what else do you want to see? Something more about Blockbench? Anything that you would like me to model out? Do you want me to have the modeling series going, maybe? It would be super fun, probably with some music and some over uh, dub, potentially, where I'm just telling you about what I'm doing. But I hope you enjoyed this very long episode of Blockbench modeling, and we're still not done with the snow golem, but we'll get to it. Trust me, it'll be done, probably in the next episode as well. Lovely stuff. But I'll see you there. See ya! Hi and welcome back into Blockbench, I am Kevin, and you are currently watching this snowman in progression. Yes, in the other episode we decided to start modeling out the snowman, and then one episode after that we decided to rework the snowman. Yeah, we were going to put him in a much more grand aspect, and that we did. We put more model details and features onto him. And in today's episode, we're going to put textures onto this guy. We're also going to do some nifty tricks that I've decided to show you in between where we're working on the textures. For optimization purposes, for example. In between episodes, I've decided to move up the nose, just one block. I've added an eyebrow, because Minecraft. And I've also a bit of a, bit of a top hat. Added that to the model itself. Now, if I want to duplicate the left arm, I click Ctrl D or right click and duplicate get a left arm too here, apparently, but if I go to transform, flip, and flip X, it's going to, and hear me out on this one, it's not only going to remove the twos, it's also going to call all of the items that are currently here, right. Mm-hmm. You believe me? It happens. Just like that. Click. Now we have a right arm with the right elbow and the right hand. Everything is right on that side. Trust me. Now I can make a texture for this. I'm going to use a template, I'm going to call this snowman, just like the file we had. Confirm, and I'm also going to remove the power to size. Everything seems good in general, confirm. Here we have it. As you can see up to the left now, the UV is filled with a bunch of information. There are all of these small blocks has been split into components that you can paint individually. But I then realize I would like to optimize this model slightly before doing that. I, for example, know that I want the left side to look the same as the right side of the model. 
Hmm, so how do I achieve that? Well, one way to do it is to not have to paint the right side with the left side. Let's delete all of that. Let's also delete the right arm. And now I'm going to look for components that are individual on the right side that would also exist on the left side. So this one, this one, this one, this one, and of course that part of the hat. All of those are now removed. They don't need to exist on the texture palette because they will use the same textures as the ones on this side. For, uh, as the arm for example. So let's create a new texture, call this one snowman. We haven't saved any of this, don't worry about it. Template, confirm, remove power to size and confirm. Now the texture sheet is slightly slimmer. It's not as much going on on it. You may not be able to tell, but I can tell who's been doing this for a while. And I know for a fact that it's slightly smaller than the other one. It could also potentially say in the resolution that it is. But now selecting these elements that I took away, duplicating them, these, bum bum bum, like that, click D and transform and flip, they will now be on this side. And as you can see, apparently this one is red. Red, aha, they're using the same surface of texture on the texture sheet. All right, so let's pick the left arm as well. Do the same thing there, transform, and now it's going to be right. It's the right arm. Lovely. This is great stuff. Okay, let's get going. So now we have our snowman model here, and it's time to give him some textures. I already know, though, for a fact that there are some areas on this snowman that we can't texture. For example, the inside of this finger, because, well, we can't see in between the fingers. So one way to walk around that is while being in edit, move, for example, a finger up while painting those specific surfaces or to animate the object and then paint things. But we'll get to that further down the line. Let's now not jump ahead of ourselves. Well, I can do that. Yeah, of course, you can't see anything of this anyway. So I am going to save my project, go to save project and then put it somewhere on your computer. You don't need to see where I'm putting mine, but I'm just going to call this one snowman the way we wrote it before. Like that. Good. Now it said it said snowman maybe model. And I'm also going to do the same thing with the texture. Well, you see this little icon right here. It says that it hasn't saved a texture in your computer. It's good to save the texture on your computer because you could add a texture into this example, for example, Photoshop, and do tweaks on the texture there, save the texture and then reload it into Blockbench and see the updates in real time in Blockbench. So I'm going to save that one as well. I'm going to call it Snowman, like this. And it has to be a PNG texture, which of course also Blockbench adds by default. Lovely stuff. Okay, seems like we're good to go with painting. So now we come to a different situation. If I were to put flat colors onto everything, which I'm always doing when I'm starting modeling something out, so I know what is what and how I would like to approach it from there on, this would already look more detailed than the first snowman with it. And how do I know that? Well, you can tell by the silhouette. So let's see here, grab some orange for the nose, do that. And if you remember how I did to paint all of it at a very quick pace, I just clicked and held down while dragging along with the paint bucket tool. There we have the nose, it's all orange and happy. We want to have snow, but I also know the snow is not necessarily completely white. It also has a slight blue tint to it, so I'm going to pick something that is slightly teal, maybe a bit ice-ish, and then closer to the blue here. And then I'm going to do that all over all of the faces that is going to be snowman, snowman. Mm -hmm. Like so, doggo, 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 like so. Now, the cool thing is, because I have mirror painting turned on, if you remember from two episodes ago, and I am also have flipped some of these objects, when I turn around, it's also already painted this side. It's lovely, isn't it? Same thing for the back. Da -da 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 -da. Like so. Just pulling over some of these extra surfaces underneath as well, because, yep, you gotta brush your armpits, little snowman. That's just a way of life. Same thing here, same thing here. The chin, and underneath the chin. Yep, see we missed one. There we have missed one. Uh, moving about, the arms are not supposed to be white. And I can also see that we did a bit of a fuck up on the nose. But don't worry, we got that sorted. Now the main bulk of the snowman has turned white. And suddenly he looks a lot more than like a snowman than compared to before, doesn't it? Right? It's kind of cool. Now I also know that I want the hat to be like a black, I guess. Not necessarily completely black, so I'm going with like a darker grey. You can go darker grey with whatever color you have, as long as you're on this side of the screen with that. Darker grey. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing. Pull and paint, pull and paint, pull and paint, pull and paint. And on the back, pull and paint, pull and paint. And remember, if you do something like, whoops, did that, control Z, or whoops, that, edit, undo. Or if you want it to be there, redo. Undo. 
good 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 we got the hat there now let's find a color for the arms i'm gonna go with the brown which i know is something you find on the orange scale and then you go into a bit like the gray tone right here and i'm gonna do that as the same thing pull that all over the arms like so and like a so and like a so and underneath like a so oh seems like we missed that side as well now, all in all, one could argue that this snowman is already much more alive than the one we did before or previously. But I would argue that we can do a lot more to bring life into this snowman. Because I were to go into edit, we can start looking and feeling it. It's an interesting guy, isn't it? He could do a lot, I guess, especially when we animate him. I also made sure that we could animate the hat separately from the rest of the body. You never know why, right? But you could. All of the body components are animatable. But regardless, we're going to go back into paint. And now let's start working on some of the things that are called shadings. Yeah, shadings. Essentially, trying to figure out what part of these, like, well, of this, this model wouldn't necessarily, when light is coming down from above, have as much light, like, well, affecting it. So I'm going to go with a slightly darker blue, a bit grayish here. And I'm going to add it under the eyebrow. And then a bit down below. So now the eyebrow is somewhat shadowing the surface below. I'm also going to go with that. The entire neck right here is not lit up. Same thing with underneath here. I could essentially just use the paint bucket for that. And I'm also going to assume that potentially we could add a bit of like a shape to the corners of the head. Down here. Same thing here. Like here. Not this one. So we're going to alt over that and like that. It's a bit more shape to the guy, maybe too much when I did that, okay. Now I'm gonna go with a rough paint approach to this. I'm not gonna go super detailed or working with very, very smooth gradients. That's not the goal here. The goal is to bring the concept forward and try to make you see how you could work it. Uh, and figuring out for yourself how you would like to approach something like this when you're working in your own models. But I'm still gonna put shadow underneath here because I consider these areas to be something where light maybe wouldn't strike and also potentially on these ones as well just so we get a bit of a depth and as you can see already now the snowman has been given a lot more well depth value this is like a base shadow that's already hitting the little guy all over the body a lovely it's a lovely over the body solution okay we do that and we're also going to do that on the surfaces below here, like so, and then up a bit on the insides like this. So why am I painting the insides like I'm currently down right here? Well, that's because I want to create a bit of like a circular shape. I wanted this not so super circular model to feel slightly more rounded. And you get that feel now. If you compare the white to before, this is much more round. At first approach than it was when looking at the entire thing as uh, the white rounded space so essentially what i'm trying to achieve is a look that brings out the shape of a more round snowball on top of the character by kind of taking in consideration how these different textures affect different parts of the body so that's an interesting way to think in about it and how to approach it so do that do the potential i can even go one further up here Potentially, I'm sure, maybe. Maybe I'll just add a bit more extra color on this one as well. Just maybe, maybe, baby. Like a soul. And I like a de soul. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we'll go with that. Face added, face has that, face value. Mm hmm. Good, good, good. Potentially would like to add some shadow underneath here, but I'm not going to do that. Now on the armpits, why not add some shadow right there? Just that it happens a bit so that you can kind of like guess that, well, where the arms are tucked in, it's somewhat bit frozen, it's slightly colder, it's more watery in the snow. There we go with that. Now, a bit of a gradient under the eye doesn't really matter too much. So I'm going to go with like just a slightly, slightly lighter one. And then a slightly lighter one again underneath there. Just so that it happens a bit more. And then, of course, under the nose as well, also going to add a bit of a gradient. Like I just saw. And we're going to take the black, figure out where the eyes goes for this guy. Are they going to go in here? <laughs> it's really funny. Um, mm, no, no, we're going we're gonna to go with the eyes in by the center. I think that's the better one. Would he look a bit creepy if I were to give him like a yellow glow? Maybe. 
Hmm, slightly too alive. I think it's better if we keep to the dark blue. Maybe an even darker one. Yeah, like that maybe. You can kind of see that. He's, he's a friendly guy. He doesn't want to do anyone harm or stuff like that. It's just a, a friendly everyday snowman. Maybe he even has. And now I'm going to deselect mirror painting because I want to see if I can make like a proper snowman mouth by clicking this about as I prefer. And yeah. <laughs> wow, somebody really had to go with you, didn't they? <laughs> you look creepy, Beyond. All right. <laughs> Regardless, mirror painting back in again. Uh, add some more to the side of the face, like a saw, like a saw, because I consider that's how potentially the eyebrow would have been connected. It's a bit more like frozeniness that goes on to that. And then, of course, also I need to add the shadow underneath the hat, because the hat is sitting on the top of the head. And then we can take this thing we're working on just currently or recently and add that as an extra shadow gradient underneath the hat as well. So as I said, no crazy shadows, just some very basic overall shading. So we get like a good, a good idea what this guy is. So let's zoom out a bit, go back into edits. So we can see the thing in action. Hmm. Suddenly this snowman is much more alive than the previous one, and I haven't even started touching the arms with some cool effects or added depth. But you can see that it's already very alive, just based on the fact that I added some extra color value down below. So, let's go back into paint. Now I would like to bring some more white into it, and I left it with a slightly darker tint than white with the more blue, because then white shines better. So let's say I would like this part to glisten a bit. I'll add a bit like a highlight there and like a highlight thing there. Maybe like a highlight on there. On here as well, maybe a highlight could go. Okay, now mirror painting potentially doing some highlighting on the sides could be an interesting thing just to kind of... And also notice how I am placing it in like a shape, an L shape. This L shape is supposed to represent the roundiness that these different figures would uh, uh, kind of, uh, well, achieve by the shape. Same thing, gonna go over the head here and see if I can add some, some round shape feel to it. And deselect mirror painting because I know if I mirror paint on the back, it's gonna be added on the front and I don't want that to happen. So, do that. We're gonna do the same thing on this one. And just like within on the front with that one, we're also gonna do this on the back. So we're kind of repeating the system a bit, okay? Let's go into edit and take a look. Now we can see that the snowman has a lot of extra depth, just simply due to the fact we added that little white highlight. So this is a way you can approach your model, your texture, and give it more life without essentially breaking it down too much, okay? Let's see here now, go for the arm. I want to have a bit of a darker shade on the arm at the very core of it, so I'm going to go and mirror paint select, not for the necessarily need it, but I'm going to do it regardless, so... The first three pixels are going to be darker, like so. Then I'd like to go with a slightly brighter tone that is somewhere in between these two, just to get a gradient. I'm going to go two pixels that has that tone, like so. And then, of course, I'm going to go a slightly darker tone at the very, very base. Now I also have four different wood tones that I could use for the rest of the arm. That is interesting to know and also good to know. So on the left hand, I know that this is where the finger goes, the thumb. And I think it could be kind of cool to give the thumb a bit of a of a pronunciation visually. And when I say by pronunciation, I mean that it, it's more visible that this is actually the thumb limb. It shows up. It has more attention brought into it its color. And I can also, of course, add uh, uh, the darker in here. We go back to bring in the slightly brighter wood color right there. So we're adding like a bit of a knob to it and then like so, do a bit of a gradient, so where the stick is going out of the hand, it happens a bit more to it. Okay, like so, like so, like so. And then we'll also make the tip slightly darker. So it coexists with the approach that we did there. Now I could also take this and add a slightly darker tone to that. And over here, hmm, that's an interesting approach. How will I do with the fingers? Well, I would guess that going over the fingers like this would be the best way to go about it. But as I said before, I can't really paint the fingers on the inside. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in, pull them apart. Same thing with the thumb for here. 
And since I have duplicated this hand to the other side, I don't need to do this on the other side. I just need to do it here so that I can see all of the limbs as they are. Because they share the same textures. So when I'm doing this on this side, it'll automatically fill in the same effect on the other side. Lovely, right? Good stuff. All right, first one down there. And I can do like a second limby thing over here, like a so. Same thing for that one, like a so. Now we also want to add sure that this one is the same thing on that edge, that we have the bright here. And that the darker one is there, that the brighter one is there. I could also go with a slightly darker tone for this cap here. Like so, same thing in there. Good, darker there, darker there. Darker there. Are we any missing? Seems okay-ish for now. Maybe do this for that one. That's a cooler effect. It's a bit of like a more gradient approached look for it. Mm hmm seems good. We'll do the same thing on this finger as well. Add a darker top to it. Good gradient approach to that. Then we should, of course, also add a slightly smoother loop in that part, and that end, and that is already there. Okay, good. Now I can remove it all back into, not remove it, but move it all back into position. I didn't move the folders, I only moved the squares within the folders so all the limbs and things are working where they're supposed to be now that doesn't look too shabby does it well i do see that i would like to add that i think that looks really good snowman looks creepy he has these fingers which are to some extent visually articulated you can kind of see where it's slightly darker that's where the limb kind of switches so if i were to select here and rotate you could see that whoops this is sort of where the limb is put, which is an approach that I would like to have. Now, what I'm going to do though, is to bring the pivot of these up one to the edge, because when you're working with limbs, usually a bit like on your own finger, they have a certain point of where they're connected at. And in animation, we always try to uh, account for that. And the way to do that is by putting Let's say, for example, the knee. If I wanted to rotate the knee, it would be better for me to rotate the knee at the very outer edge of the kneecap instead of rotating it at the middle of inside the leg. Because if rotating at the middle of the side of the leg, as I'll, I'll give you an example here, if it's in the middle and I rotate it, then I'll break it open. But if I rotate it by moving the pivot to the very edge like this, I'll not break it open. And it'll rotate in a much more suitable, visible fashion. But regardless, it wasn't the cubes I was supposed to move around. It was the <laughs> the folders. So let's do that instead. Two up. Left pointy, two up. Right dipper dipper donkey, put the two up. Left a pinky, two up. Hand. Mm, that one I'm gonna leave there because I think that's the better place for it. And the thumb. Good dipper donkey up, like there. Good. Now we'll go to the other side. I'm gonna take this one and see right thumb tip. Needs to be over there in this folder. The right thumb needs to be there in this folder. Uh, and the same thing goes for the pointy. It could be over at the top. Tip could be over at the top. Right pinky could be over at the top. And of course the pinky finger as well could be over at the top. Now I think all of those are at the right position. At the elbow I'm going to do the same thing. At the elbow, not the cube, like so. And then at the same thing over here at the elbow, I'm also going to move it over here. Things to be in the right spot, not this cube though, forgot to move the thumb there. Okay, good. Now it seems like everything in its set position. We could play around with the snowman in a much more fun fashion. But I do think we are better off working on the animations in a separate video. And I'm also going to round up the hat, add a bit more depth to it as well, and some to the nose. But that would be in between these episodes. And when you're watching the next, next episode, it's time to give this guy some motion. And I hope that you have found interest in use of these episodes, one by one, trying to kind of teach you how to work with Blockbench, give you some inspiration on how to work with textures, how to work your way around the interface, how to model something out. But if there's anything that you think I'm missing out on that you would like me to focus down on more in modeling or in concept ideas on how to approach textures or animation, 
if you want me to, for example, sit down and do a Photoshop episode and I'm just talking about textures and the way you think about shading and stuff like that, do tell me down in the comments. I'll be more than happy to look into that because these are really fun to do and it's all me trying to give to the community for the better good because you guys, you deserve having fun learning, knowing and exploring the potentials of Minecraft just like I have done over all of these years playing that lovely, fantastic game. So, without further ado, let me head off and I'll see you in the next episode. Hello and very welcome back into Blockbench, I am Kevin and in this episode we are going to try to look into giving this guy some emotion. Yes, that is very correct. In between episodes I've done some tweaks to the texture, added a bit of an extra depth to the hat up here as well, a red line and some extra colors around and I can see that I don't feel like I'm completely fine with that just yet. Let me just go over this ever ever so quickly and do that and do that. And I've done it over here. How come I didn't do it on the... Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, sometimes you apparently don't do everything that you think you do. But you do it good enough to get halfway at least. So I'm just gonna go bumpy dump like that. Add that little extra there, extra there, and the one there. Hmm. Mirror painting. Up on the cheek, get up on the cheek. I just felt like I wanted it to be ever so slightly more round than compared to before. So all in all, now I would say that our snowman is in a better shape than it had been before. So it has a bit of a shadow underneath the nose, you can see it's slightly darker as well. Tried to get the hat slightly, haven't apparently gotten that slightly dark, but all in all I should. So let's get the bottom of the hat just put it, put it, put it slightly darker. And of course the rim here is going to be ever so slightly darker as well. Uh, slightly darker than the rest. Okay. Now that seems to have done most of the trick. And I would of course also like to add a bit of a highlight here. On the very edges of the hat. Like a saw, like a saw. Let's see how that looks. I'm going to click outside of it and go to edit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that adds just the extra, extra little depth shape that I would have in this snowman. So, this is where we're at today. I begin by clicking Control S to save. Control Hold that and click S while you have saved the file. And if you haven't saved the file, you will now be given an open window into your folder system on computer where you can actually save the Blockbench file. So that's good to know uh, if you haven't done that in the past, of course. But regardless, it's time to give this guy some emotion and to animate things in Blockbench. We have a nifty little thing up here to the very right, the very, 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 very top right that says animate. Mm -hmm. Let's click that. Oh, interesting. Now we have a new interface to work with. Okay, let's get going. What, what, what is everything? Well, we have the outliner left from before. And in the outliner now, we can not see the individual blocks. If I were to go to edit, you can see how we can see all these individual cubes that are things on the model. In animate, they don't exist. In edit, they do. In animate, they don't. It's good. So in animate, the only thing we care about are all of these different components that are essentially limbs on our character. And these we can rotate, move, and to some extent also scale. Now I'm not going to use the scale tool and for most reasons it never uses or works in Minecraft anyway. So we'll stick to rotate and move for this. What I would like to do first is to just pose this guy in a new pose. But to do that, first of all, we need to understand a few things about animation. Animation is you tell something to be in one rotation or position at one frame in a timeline. So let's say one second I want it to be over there and for the next five seconds I would like it to move to over there and rotate to somewhere. Mm -hmm. How is that done? Well it's done with this so-called timeline editor here at the bottom. This has nothing right now but if I were to select one of these bones, let's say the root for example, it would show up here if I had animation. Now I have no animation so Minecraft just goes, well, yeah, 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 where am I supposed to put stuff? I'm not sure. And I could also see that apparently, <laughs> just apparently, the pivot for the base and the root is not where I want them to be. Mid pivot is perfect. It's where I want the mid block to be. But these ones aren't. So I'm going to go back into edit, select pivot, and I'm going to put them down to, to zero. Put the pivot pivot zero. Okay, good. I'm going to select root, do the same thing with root. It's at zero, zero, zero. You can see it under on the pivot position here. Good, back into animation. Now they're at the bottom of the character, also at the ground level of the Minecraft. So, okay, 
To animation, we first need to add animation. And that is done by going to this little window over here, click on the plus that says add animation. If we already have animations for this particular model or an equally rigged model, we can use import animation. And something worth knowing about import animation, the only way they will work is if you have a model that uses all of the very same setup as you have here. All of the folders has to be named the very, very same thing. That is one of the key components to that. So let's go back into it. And animation, we're going to start with that. And this one is going to be called uh, Pulse. We'll just, well, yeah, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll call it Pulse. Start a Pulse. Because in this one, I don't want to do any motion. I just want to put the guy in a, like a, in a motion position. So first of all, I'm not sure that I would like the snowman to look like this. Like if the snowman were to sit out in the world, I'm fairly certain that he would have like the arm bending in a direction or so. So I'm going to select the left arm by either clicking on the component here in the viewport or by clicking on that particular folder right here. Now, no, when I rotate this, everything that is in a folder underneath, not underneath in here, key here, but like so that it's within this line right here, it's, it's called that it's childed to the parent. This one controls the rotation of and position of all of these things in relation to where this one is in the world. So this, for example, rotates from here. This rotation point will rotate in accordance to this rotation point. So if I do this, you can see that the entire arm follows along. Same thing goes now when I have this, the entire outer arm rotates along. And you can also see that apparently I have missed fixing the textures at this very elbow. Whoopsies! But don't worry about that. I'm not going to break the elbow and it's supposed to rotate in this angle only. So I shouldn't have to deal with that. But we could fix it, so why not? Let's do that while we're at it. Uh, we'll keep the animation window. This is important to know. If I were to go to edit now, it's locked. It's closed. But if I were to go into animate, to this very key, on this very animation, it's open, and I can then go to paint, then it's going to leave me with that open that I already had from the animation window. So I can paint in that, then return here, and of course, rotate it all the way back to where it was initially. And you can see here on the rotation on the left, what rotation it currently holds on that particular limb. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? It's maybe a bit fast. I've done animation for many, many years, and if this is quick for you, Please tell me down in the comments and I'll see if there's a way I can get this like across in a more condensed or simpler fashion. But all in all, all you need to know is that as long as you have this folder system on the right, everything that is put in a folder will rotate with that folder. That's how it works. So for this snowman to be a bit scary, what I would like to do was well, not scary, but I would like to segregate the fingers a bit on this side. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to bend them inwards slightly, mm, like a saw, like a saw, you know, like snowman would usually, I guess. Standing looking a bit creepy out there in the snow, like a saw, maybe like a saw. Rotate it in a position where it kind of makes sense with the motion. And also maybe move that finger up and maybe move that finger down a bit. That's good. I think that's a good pose. Now we can also choose to move the hand, which we made earlier, like a so. And the elbow, like a so. And then we can choose to move the arm, like a so. And suddenly, there's a lot more character to this snowman than we had before or previously. So I'm going to rotate the arm up like that, because I think that this is sort of like a more snowman-esque hand pose. So I can see once again that we have a bit of an opportunity to paint in here that I'm going to take. Every situation I get to repaint something that I've forgotten is a good situation and apparently I've forgotten just that little extra. Okay, seems all good. Good. Well, it's not necessarily all good. Considering I can't necessarily see that face here. I can. I can. Now look at this. This is like next level cheekiness. I guess it is green there. I'm just going to zoom in and click it. Oh, that's clever. Could not have done that over here, apparently, obviously, where it would have been much easier and I wouldn't have to move anything. But, you know, sometimes you'd like to do things the, the hard way. So that's there. Okay, let's post the other arm, go back into animation. Hmm. This one... Um, I could do them the same way, but I think it's interesting if it's slightly different. So I'm going to go with this one, like a... Like a diso, and then maybe like bending forward a bit, and then bending like this, like a bit, and like this. Maybe bending the thumb slightly, like with that. We'll do that finger much higher this time. 
and with like an even more crooked appearance on the on the pointy finger and then bring the pinky down further so it's like yeah more free and open in comparison to before i think that's good now the nose as well can also be rotated like we did before so i'm gonna rotate it up not too much maybe down nope oh, i'll leave it where we had it and the hat can be rotated around its its edge like so so maybe we'll lean it ever so slightly like so maybe and move it down like with one click that's maybe too much so we'll hold shift instead move it back up and then shift it down now i can see that bleeds on that edge you can see how this shows through so i'm gonna move it like maybe a bit forward does that look bad on the back yes it does okay so we'll undo all of that all the way back to here and then undo the rotation as well so we'll go with the slightly lesser rotation if i hold control i can get like a smaller angle on the rotation when working on it like so we'll hold control we'll move it in as well so we're out here it's maybe a bit too much on rotation still like so maybe maybe rot rotating it like turning it a bit could be good like so potentially backwards a bit is this too much just bad you have to play around with this to get the, the feel that you're looking for. But I think it's kind of good. Now I also want to rotate his head a bit so that it's looking a bit upwards and maybe rotate his front body a bit so that it's kind of like a bit forward. It's so, it's so, oh, it's a, oh, it looks a bit creepy, doesn't it? Oh, it's close to Halloween this year when this video is produced regardless. So maybe it's maybe it's for the better good. Or maybe it's like this is embracing you with open arms kind of like in a laughing way. Now... All I've done here is to reposition all of the of the limbs and positions. But what you also notice is that everything that I've selected here, piece by piece, has shown up here. And you have the hat, you have the mid, and it has this little symbol next to it. Rotation, position, rotation. These are called keyframes. And what they allow us to do is to essentially tell the character that here where this is going to go, here is where we're going to go with that. And... And yada yada it's as i said before when i want something that is right here right now over time to move to somewhere else what i would do with the keyframe is that i have one keyframe for this rotation and this position and then let's say i take my mouse and i click somewhere on this timeline i'm gonna move to the key line relocator the timeline player let's say to four seconds by just clicking you can just click on three as well this snaps by default your program is set to snap by oh 0.04 seconds i've turned my up to 0.05 because of some uh, java minecraft projects don't worry about that it's up to you if you want to change that it's also doable in the settings um so let's say i wanted to go by three seconds right here and at three seconds i would like this to rotate forward right but as you can see seems like nothing has happened here i don't get this little symbol but that is because this block or this section where we selected the mid is not the one we're looking at right here so let's see if we can get selected or look at mid if it's somewhere around yeah here's mid and there is very correct there's a keyframe there interesting so what happens now if i click on this timeline relocator and drag well lo and behold there is motion added hmm interesting Two things then to note about this timeline. First, you have the symbol over here, this little blue thing. This can also be dragged and put somewhere else. This notes the end of your animation. It says, this is where the animation ends. This is all of the keyframes that I'm going to export whenever I'm exporting this animation. Everything that is from zero to this point will be the animation. Now, by default, if you're playing an animation and it's not at the end keyframe of all of or any of the objects or targets that you have in your scene, it will automatically move to the last one when you play. And to play this one, you either click on play animation here or you click on spacebar on your keyboard. I'm going to do spacebar, spacebar, and you can see how it leans forward and it stops and it goes back to the beginning. Okay, cool. Now, right-clicking on the animation, I can set it to loop, override, update variable, and other things. What I'm going to do here is to loop it, because I would like the snowman to rock back and forth in this animation. So I'm going to pull that one. You Did you see what I did? I clicked in the space, held left-click, dragged, and thus selected this particular keyframe. Left-click, drag, and now it's blue. If I want to deselect it, I click 
somewhere around it or just not on it somewhere else i can select it here click somewhere else it's not deselected i have to click somewhere else within the timeline field to deselect it so put that one on too and now i want to copy the first one so i'm going to drag over it Control c Control c for copy then move my timeline relocator to where i want in time to reposition back at the start again like at the start of the motion so i want this one to return to that keyframe then I'm going to relocate it there, make sure that I have selected this one on the mid object that I'm moving this keyframe within, copied it, had this moved, and then Control V for paste. Now it's taken this keyframe and pasted it over here. If I were to accidentally select it an other object and done the same thing, it would paste that keyframe on that object, which means that that object itself would also now do the translation to those new coordinates, those new values that this one had. Which means that, yeah, you can essentially accidentally make some really weird fun motions in this software, but that's how animation is. It's a long learning curve process. So we have a rocking forth and a rocking back. That's what this guy does. And it's going to do like that, back and forth, back and forth. Now this is a simple and fun animation, right? Let's make it slightly creepier, shall we? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to go in at one second. I'm going to do the the like arm a bit like that. And like I saw, and then I'm going to do the same thing here. Copy and paste that arm movement all the way to the back. going to go back to this arm. And the beginning movement, copy and paste at the back. So now it has an up and a down, and an up and a down. Okay, maybe, maybe it's interesting, I don't know. One thing that is also quite creepy is if an object is always looking at something. We had a target here, this snowman is supposed to look somewhere. Okay, I would like him to look straight ahead to something around here. Now. If I want to keep him looking that direction, I kind of have to compensate for the fact that he's currently leaning forward his upper body. So I'm going to rotate the head back up a bit so that it's still looking in that direction and then copy the first frame and put it at the very back. Now, there's no man leaning forward but he's still looking at the same target while the rest of the body is moving. These are just some basic animation principles on how to make things look and feel a bit more alive. And you can play around with them as much as you like to. I'm going to do a bit more movement just for the sake of it. So. Let's see here, I would like the hat to move a bit. And when he's leaning forward, maybe I want the hat to just ever so slightly go like behind to here. That frame, it just leans for slowly, slowly behind. And then it kind of falls back the other direction, just, just, just slightly whenever he leans back. Like so, let's see here. So very, 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 very slight movement. And then he turns and it goes back. And very, very slight movement. And we copy the first frame, put it over the, the end. Like so. Play again. Deselect. And maybe it's a bit quick. Do like that, maybe. We'll go with this and do some more motion to it slowly like that. Oh, that's good. Now it has like a nice bounce. Although it's a bit of a bounce. You can maybe do it a bit slower as well. Like a slower bounce. Maybe it's bouncing in a different way. Like slower, like boop, bouncing back up. Mm, potentially. Could do that. We could also, also, in the very beginning of the motion, add a bit of like a backwards motion as well. Just like we had over here. So it's like, oh, whoa, back in there. We can remove the key in between. It's moving like that, it's moving back, it's moving forth, it's moving back, it's, Okay, interesting. And then maybe we want to lean the body a bit on the sides, so this like leaning, woo, like this, and then the same thing on here, like that. Now I'm also going to compensate for the head in this motion, so that it's still looking forward, like so balancing it because we want this guy to be really freaky so it's always like looking proper forward uh, well you can see that that's a nice movement it's almost like the head is like circulating see here like oh oh yeah oh, oh, oh. okay still very very basic movement there's nothing crazy to this but it's a cool way that you can play around with it now what i would implore you to do is of course to take everything that you 
seen in this episode and try to apply it to something else. Something that you've made in Blockbench and tweet it to me. Tweet it at Arts by Kev. Let me see what you have done. I'm really curious right now. It's interesting to see if anyone has taken anything from this little video series and made something like actively themselves that could be kind of cool. I would be so, so amazed to just see you guys' productions and creative, uh, creations in general. Really, really curious. Oh, that's creepy. I'm just gonna go some weird finger snaps. Why not? Let's go that. Okay, like weird finger snappy. Ooh, ooh, finger snappy snappy. It's like, like that. Oh, like that. Oh, another one over here. Wow, like that. And then first frame, of course, back to the beginning again. Maybe move all of these ones over here. Be creepy. This one goes like, uh, snack, snack, uh, uh, did I forget to redo the first motion? Yeah, I did. Okay. So let's see here. That one goes there. Goes there. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, this guy is getting freakier. So <laughs> freak animations are usually quite sporadic. There's a lot that you can read onto when it comes to animation and try to proper put forth a certain feel or emotion or characteristic. This is just some very basic movement to try to, well, show you how you can work with animation on this guy in particular. Because why not? I'm, I'm not sure. If you have actually put this project together yourself, then show me. Show how you did your snowman. What you gave it for emotion. If you have any like fun things, maybe he's like dropping his hat or lifting his hat with his arm and like, oh, hello and stuff like that. It would be so fun to see. So without further ado, I hope that this series has been helpful to you. If you would like to like this video, it would be help me out very much in return. And comment what last you want to see the next. What more projects can I produce that would be in your interest? Are we supposed to make like a modeling series where I take proper bigger things like the snowman for example and do it like a speed up um, uh, time lapse kind of approach where you can see me working out a bigger concept and talking over it and explaining how I'm thinking, my thought process, bringing things into Photoshop, doing weird textures in that maybe, like some photo manipulation to it. Tell me, I have no idea what you would like to see, but it would be so fun to see if we can come up with something cool. So, with that, have a great day, subscribe, and I'll see you around in the next tutorial episode. Have a great one.